All right, so before we get started, I know Bailey gave a terrific introduction to each of our job titles, thank you. Uh, but I would also like to take uh, this opportunity and um, have each of you all introduce and give a little more context on the, you know, backgrounds that you're coming from um, in maybe a 30 second introduction, uh, starting with you, Stephen. Hello, my name is Stephen Burrard. Um, I'm co-founder and CTO at Atom. Um, Atom is an edge application framework for resource constrained devices. It allows uh, developers to build, deploy, update, manage, and monitor and troubleshoot um, edge applications on the smallest of constrained devices. Um, my background, um, I spent a lot of time in the OS world, uh, working in the Windows kernel team at Microsoft. I've spent a, a fair amount of time in the industrial uh, space at Schneider Electric. Um, and so I've brought a lot of those two worlds, kind of managing these things and understanding how to build these systems and, and, and deploy these applications at scale. Oh, yeah, so Chris Woods, I'm from Siemens. Um, been coordinating a lot of the Siemens work around WebAssembly. Uh, we've been looking at WebAssembly now for about four or five years. Um, you know, and uh, I think Siemens is a pretty big organization, so um, th there's a fair chance that everybody here who came into this room has touched something that Siemens built, made, or maintained. Mm -hmm. So the electricity that comes in here, if you took a train, light rail, 80% of the railroad crossings are Siemens, and when you get into those systems, they look an awful lot internally. The software architecture starts to look a lot like what we see in the cloud, except you don't get a 500 server error when things go wrong. <laughs> you get people losing arms and limbs or electricity going down. So it's, um, it's a surprising lot of parallels between the two, and that's one of the reasons why we started looking at WebAssembly. Um, Larry Carvalho, I'm an independent analyst, cover cloud native technologies and edge computing. And when my interest in edge computing, you know, grew, I thought that, you know, the, I have to cover Wasm to see how is it going to play a role, especially in what we're going to talk next in this, in this session. I'm Dan Dimitriou, uh, Mitakura, which is part of Sony Group. And uh, what we do is build intelligent sensors, mainly for computer vision on the edge. So we kind of stumbled upon WebAssembly out of a real technical need to basically build safety and isolation into the deployable, changeable components of these sensors. Uh, and we've been working on it for about, I would say, over four years now. Um, thank you. Um, so yeah, thank you, but uh, I am Divya, and uh, as Bailey currently mentioned, I'm uh, the principal technology advocate at SUSA, so a lot of my work is in the cloud native WebAssembly space, so as much as y'all are going to learn from this panel, I'm probably going to learn a lot more. Um, so I'm directly going to jump right in, and uh, Stephen, I think the first question is for you, right? Um, in the embedded uh, world, um, you all operate under real constraints in terms of resources. Um, so what benefits does uh, WebAssembly bring to um, you know, this ecosystem and you know, these sort of resource-constrained environments? And what should the WebAssembly community here uh, actually be aware of um, in terms of the benefits and the resource constraints that you all operate in? Uh, sure. Thanks, Divya. Um, first, I'll talk a little bit about these constrained devices. You know, they're, they're everywhere. As Chris mentioned, um, they're all around us. They're in our cars. They're in um, our smart home devices. They're in a multitude of things that you don't even know exist. Um, but one of the things that is really common here is they're very resource constrained. And by resource constrained, I mean they could be limited in CPU. They could be limited in the amount of memory they have, how fast that memory is. They could be limited by the network connection if they have one at all. It could be very slow, very high latency. Um, and very often they're, they're battery operated. They're used in all these different places. Um, but if you look at the programming uh, model for that, it's largely what we did in the 90s on, on the server side. It's monolithic programming. It's generally in C, sometimes C++. Um, everything gets linked together in a single binary. So, as we all know, that there's a lot of friction to go do that, right? Especially in large organizations. You know, Chris, you know, we've all worked in large organizations where there's a group that does the sensor stuff, there's a group that does the analytics, there's a group that supports the applications. So you have to get all those people to, to get together, integrate that code, and then build that into a single image, right? And then even if you do a single line change of code, you gotta retest that entire image, you gotta deploy that whole image. There's just a lot of friction in that chain. And so the ability to keep these things up to date, 
to patch bugs, to support them, to troubleshoot them, or just build modular architectures just has a lot of friction to them. And so when you start looking at that world and say, how do we revolutionize that? Right? And then you go look at the cloud side, like the cloud native folks, they have all these cool tools. They have containers, they have components, they have dynamic loading, they have all sorts of things. And so what, what we did is we looked at those two and we said, hey, you know, why does that have to be? You, know, you look at the embedded devices today, the amount of CPU they have, while it's constrained, has the ability to do a, a lot of these things. And so we've started to reimagine that, and that's where we stumbled upon uh, WebAssembly. So when you look at WebAssembly, um, to, to get to your question, Divya, you know, which, there's a lot of really interesting properties of that. You know, it was designed to be secure by default. Right? It's designed to be running in your browser, running code that you don't know where it came from. Right? Or if you're a developer, your code is running in somebody's browser that you don't control. So the core security properties that was you know, built into the design of that are really attractive from the embedded space when you start looking at reliability in real time and, and safety critical. Um, further, it's simple. Right? So it allows us to build really small runtimes. Um, we're using WebAssembly uh, micro runtime, or, um, which I think most of us here on this panel are using in the embedded space. Um, we're able to get that runtime down to 50K, right? And that actually now fits on this device, right? Um, there was a talk yesterday with your colleague um, and Keith from Stanford where they were getting it down to about 5K by removing almost all of the runtime but still getting a lot of the benefits. So there's some really interesting things you can do to get this virtualization technology into um, into this, uh, th this class of device. You, you, just to contrast that, you look at the VM, uh, the JVM rather in Java, you look at the CLR uh, and some of the other VM technologies like that, they're much, much larger and they're just not usable on these devices. So I think being able to do that and get that into that form factor is, is key. Um, the other thing is we're actually getting isolation. So these devices generally don't have things like virtual memory. They generally don't have memory management units. So we don't have process boundaries. We don't have that kind of isolation. But with WebAssembly, we're able to do that, and we're able to do that in software, which means we can do that on cheaper hardware, and we can do that at, at scale. So a lot of really exciting things we can do. And then once we get to the, the side of software development, we have the ability to write in the language of our choice, modularize our code, update it in fractional updates. So all those cool qualities that we have with you know, containers and we're, we're doing right now in the cloud, but on this class of device. So we really can do some really interesting things that we just couldn't do before. Right. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, I had a colleague of mine, uh, Dominic, he's probably in the audience, and when we first started looking at WebAssembly, he said, wow, you can put different languages and not have C on a device? Uh, he says, yeah, we're, we're always being pushed to put more intelligence on the, ed on the edge. How many machine learning experts are also experts at embedded C? Right? They don't exist. Or if they do, they're very few and probably paid very well. So. Um, this is a way we can get some of that different skill set onto those devices. And I think there was a talk, uh, the, the American Express talk just before, where they said, oh, are we there yet? Can we use it in production? And today, the WAMA, the WebAssembly Micro Runtime that we've all been focusing on, it's deployed and in production in about 1.5 million devices that we know about at the moment. So every time you watch an Amazon Video Prime movie, that's WAMA and WebAssembly. Disney Plus, streaming, that's WAMA and WebAssembly. If you own a Xiaomi product, it's probably WebAssembly. So it's already in there and it's deployed and it's pretty successful, right? So we, we as an industry haven't yet, on the embedded side, been able to adopt Preview 2, but for the Preview 1 world, it's been tremendously successful. And it's providing that isolation and the sort of, um, cloud isolation, the same mechanics, the same programming styles, coming down to something that costs a fraction of a cost of a, of a laptop, right? You're, you're in a single digit dollar figures for this. And that's, that's revolutionizing how we build embedded software and how things will work. And that's really the advantage that's coming. And or to an extent already exists in some of our embedded colleagues' products. Just one thing I wanted to add, you know, speaking of resource constraint, today's resource constraint is very good by historical standards, right? Like it's 32-bit and memory is, let's say, on the order of tens of kilobytes to hundreds or megabytes, hundreds of kilobytes or megabytes. So it's not that bad. That means that we can do a lot more than we could do before. Um, that said, you still need to be a lot more careful than on, on a server or even a Raspberry Pi, sometimes people think a Raspberry Pi is an embedded system. No, it's not. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a supercomputer by, by, by uh, comparison, right? So uh, 
you still need to be very careful. So that's where some key properties of WebAssembly come in, which is, for example, the lack of garbage collection. That, that's one of the main reasons why Java and CLR will never run on these things, because it's everything's garbage collected. You know, it's, it's part of the fundamentals of the, uh, of the safety, you know, of the memory safety, is that it, you don't have real memory references, right? You can't forge them. WebAssembly has a totally different approach to that with the linear memory. And that's a key, that's a key point. The, the second point is that in our case, we can ahead of time compile stuff. We don't JIT, right? That's, maybe you can JIT on certain platforms, but you certainly can't on the, you know, uh, on the thing that has 32 kilobytes of, of memory, right? So these are two of the key, key properties, I think, that we need to keep in mind as a community and, and not to screw them up, you know, as, as, a, <laughs> you know, as we evolve the thing, right? So if, if ever somebody thinks that we should have everything be garbage collected, no, bad. <laughs> Certainly bad for us, you know, in the, in the embedded space. And just to add to that, I think the, the, the goal of the component model is really appealing. It's, it's pretty, the vision is spot on, and we really are super excited to adopt it when it's ready to hit these constraint, constraint devices and the, 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 the limitations that we just have. And it's, it's hard to, to do that. I mean, we joke, right? You know, the, the devices we're programming today, um, capability-wise, um, they start to look like the really expensive home computers I used to lust after as a teenager, right? <laughs> you know, I can play Doom on a microcontroller. That's pretty awesome. So they're, they're fairly capable uh, in that whole scope of things, but it still means we've got to be very judicious with what we do and try and eke out all the power uh, and performance, particularly when we get to sort of cyber-physical world and the, to the safety-critical points here. Um, when you have uh, uh, things that control stuff that moves in the real world, people can get hurt. And it doesn't matter what it is. Uh, if it's a lathe in a shop floor in a factory, if it's a railroad crossing guard, when you ask it to do something, it should do it. And it should do it within a predefined period of time. And so for us, knowing exactly what goes on in, in every, every function call, in every invocation of, of a method, understanding the timing that takes and being able to reproduce that in a deterministic way becomes really important. So I see Dan say, well, garbage collection, maybe that's not a great thing for us. It might not be for all of the stuff we do. And I have to say um, uh, to Bailey and, and the folks involved in the, the, the Bytecode Alliance, they've been tremendously receptive and we've come up to them and said, hey, we'd like to, to change things. Um, and also in the W3C, when we talked to them about garbage collection and said, hey, this is awesome for you guys. But for us, it would suck, man. <laughs> and they said, well, maybe we can create uh, WebAssembly profiles where you don't have to implement all of the garbage collection. That, and so there's been a fantastic collaboration, I think, and, it, and it's growing. So we've set up the embedded special interest group as a way to kind of drive some of our concerns from the embedded side. And the really cool thing is most of the stuff we're doing is around efficiency and determinism and performance. And anything we do and we contribute to everybody else, well, it makes uh, F5 go faster, right? It makes everybody else's products work be a little bit better. So you see us complaining about garbage collection and looking at bits and bytes, but the result should be something that benefits the entire WebAssembly ecosystem. Right, and I know you already st sort of answered the next question probably <laughs> around real-time performance. Uh, but I do want to, uh, you know, delve a little more into that in terms of, um, you know, what are some of the concerns that still very much remain? You touched upon the deterministic side of it, but uh, Dan, if you could sort of uh, delve a little more into it, that would be great. Um, sure, I'll, 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 get, I'll get things started anyway. Um, <laughs> so real time, what does real time mean? I mean, it, it basically means fast, but also deterministic, as in, you know, bounded by some, you know, probabilistically, of course, at some point, everything is, not, there's nothing, there's nothing certain in the world, yep. but as, as certain as possible. And so what we need to do there is remove the sources of non-determinism. Garbage collection is certainly one of those, you know, it, it, so is a memory allocator at some point, right? So you think various things can introduce non-determinism in the, in the way that the system operates. Um, one of the things we were kicking around yesterday was, what else can happen is uh, if there's not a coordinated approach, for example, of threading between the WebAssembly runtime and the operating system, as minimal as it is, you know, then that can introduce problems as well. You know, even with cache misses, you know, that, that may occur when you're switching thread boundaries and stuff like that. So that, for example, I think, we think, is still work that needs to continue to be done, isn't quite there yet. Um, 
um, Larry? Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Good. Yeah, just uh, one thought about real time, and I look at the business value of what you're going to get Absolutely. out of real time. Uh, there are two things. One is preventive maintenance and quality in a manufacturing environment. Yep. Um, so if you get that real time information and you want to keep your manufacturing shop floor running, you know, with high uh, reliability and uh, uptime, uh, you're going to have that b uh, build into making sure all your machines are running, yep. identifying errors up front. And, and in terms of quality, you know, getting that feedback and immediately saying, hey, there's something wrong, we need to fix it. Yep. That is a huge, you know, reduction in cost, you know, at the, to the bottom line of a manufacturing facility. Stephen, you had something to say, add on to what Larry just said. Um, actually, I was going to uh, double tap a little bit on, on, on Dan's uh, comment and then probably get a little into our next question. But when, when you start talking about these systems where you have real-time constraints and, and whatnot, um, you also run into situations where you have mixed criticality. And th that's something I think is yeah. really exciting about that, where you can have part of the system be a true real-time system with all the normal constraints you have, running potentially traditional you know, C code, right? It's certified, it's been running for years. And then alongside it, put something in a, uh, a WASM uh, runtime to run something else. You know, very often we'll have um, a web server, for example, for configuration, or maybe managing a user interface. And if that doesn't run, if it gets a 500 error, if it is slow, doesn't really matter, right? It might matter because you might care about configuring it, but it's <laughs> not going to matter from, from a correctness of the system, right? Things that, uh, you know, interlocks for safety, those things are still going to happen, right? And so I, I think that's really exciting. And obviously that's a lot more your world, Chris. Okay. Yeah, I just, I don't know, I'm going to ask for a show of hands. Has anybody written anything in the embedded space here? Wow, great, there's a good few, good. So you know when you, you do the, uh, Real-time side, you've got to pre-allocate your memory, don't, don't start messing, or if you can, don't use it at all, just use large global vari variables for everything, right? And it's a very peculiar and non-natural way of writing stuff, and it's kind of fixed, and it's a little bit awkward, to be honest, but it's pretty performant and does what you need it to do. Um, but that sort of excludes all the really cool intelligence that we want to put on it, and when you get to the polyglot side of WebAssembly, it's like, hey, you know what, we're gonna have this other component written in some other language and it's gonna run and maybe it's doing garbage collection and you know, undeterministic stuff and that's cool because the functionality is stuff that we want on this device and that mixed criticality, the ability to say, carve out this little bit, this little bit of code here, it runs inside this sandbox, it doesn't touch anything else and it can do whatever it wants to do, right? It can maybe consume, consume data um, and probably the, the best sort of real world example that you probably don't know about um, in a different industry is the, the, the uh, aircraft industry, right? You've got the black box at the back of the aircraft and it's collecting all the data and that's sort of FAA assured, don't play with this, this is sort of safety critical, needs to go to the black box. But a lot of airlines actually want to consume that data for their own process improvements and pilot training and, and predictive maintenance. And so there's a read-only port on it where you can read it, right? But this is a read-only port designed in hardware, with the hardware bill of materials and cost. Now, with WebAssembly, hey, we can do that in software. So you can have this read-only port where you're consuming the data. Maybe you're doing predictive maintenance and analytics and offline processing, and I can put it on the exact same bit of silicon that you're doing everything else on. And that's this mis mixed criticality concept, and that, that's something that's really cool. It's sort of taking the benefits of co-hosting two tenants in the cloud on the same server and bringing it to a chip that doesn't have a hypervisor. Um, and doesn't run a big server OS, it runs a tiny real-time operating system, but we can still do it. So that's, that's the really cool thing. And zooming a little bit onto that, uh, you know, aircraft thing, because we talked about, I mean, it's uh, maybe not as mission critical, but probably also is, and it's also um, important uh, in contributing to the safety and reliability aspects of, um, you know, the entire flight and, you know, the entire operations. Um, so uh, are there any specific, um, uh, you know, concerns that WebAssembly can help address in such situations and enhancing the safety around these embedded systems in a real world uh, prospect? Um, are there like, you know, some light, uh, is there some light that you can shed, sorry? 
Yeah, so probably the, the best example is this sort of mixed criticality world. Um, but to be honest, we haven't yet seen a fully safety critical certified WebAssembly runtime. So it doesn't, that doesn't exist yet. But what's so exciting, and this is where I say, well, we're in production, but there's more to come. Uh, what's so exciting is the building blocks for this are starting to appear. So the core WebAssembly spec, it's written in a DSL, uh, SpecTech. And we have something that can be machine read and interpreted and automatic proofs generated for correctness. And we start to head towards this exciting world where, hey, this is just around the corner. When this comes and we have a safety critical runtime, we, we just sort of expand upon the, the range of devices and use cases we can use it in in the embedded world. Um, but Stephen, you were talking yesterday to me about how many ARM chips are shipped every year. What was it? I'm totally going to get the number wrong, but it was it was billions every year. Um, and if you look at that, you know, there's multiple classes of ARM, ARM chips, obviously. So most of the ARM chips that we think of are the ones that are in our phone or maybe in our tablets or, or PCs. That's like about a third of what ARM ships every year. Right? The, the amount of um, chips that they ship in the real-time space, in the microcontroller space, are, are, are twice that, right? And so I want to say on the order of, I think it was like 4.2 billion chips a year. So, I mean, it, it's an enormous amount of chips. And I'd say about half of those are really, really small fixed functions, like I, things that would be in like your ABS control system, right? Cores, minor correction, right? Cores, cores. not, not cores. chips. Cores. That's true, yeah, they license it by cores, yes, <laughs> by cores, yes. Um, and so, so about half of those are really, really, really um, tiny, right? They're, they're very fixed functions. But the other half of those are these general purpose microcontrollers, right? And that's where a lot of this uh, per pertains. Yeah, and just for, for safety, right? The, the main thing about safety is when things go wrong, they go wrong in a predictable way. So you know what's gonna happen. So if, you've, yeah. if you're gonna stick your hand in front of a, a flying blade, you know it's gonna stop. <laughs> um, safety is not what happens to me and my Tesla when it decides to reboot while I'm driving it. <laughs> That's not safety critical. Or well, at least it's not the user perception of safety critical, so. <laughs> Yeah, my, my view on the whole thing is the operational systems, uh, you really got to figure out how you're going to manage the safety because there are nation states looking to, you know, attack, attack the water systems, attack the electrical systems, attack the rail systems. So I think the, what, what Chris, you know, you're talking about in, you know, certified, you know, safety core, that's going to play a big role in preventing something like this. You're going to see much more of these potential attacks as we go on in the next, you know, 10 years, five years, 10 years, and we are going to see certain software and hardware built together be the way in which to prevent it. Yeah, if I can just add a little bit. I, th I think security is, is a huge important topic. We could probably talk for multiple hours on it. <laughs> Um, but the fact of the matter is we have to deal with the, these potential cybersecurity attacks. And if you look at how traditional embedded systems are built, they're monolithic applications, they run in the same uh, process space generally. And so if any bad code gets in there, if anybody you know, exploits a security bug, you can take down the whole system, safety included, right? When you start partitioning this into separate modules that run independently, right? If I were to attack one module, maybe I can do something bad there, but the blast zone of that attack is, is often limited to that zone. And I think building that you know, in a modular way, in a defense in depth way, brings us much more resilient systems. And you know, it's hard to build these secure systems. This is just another tool that helps us build these systems better. Yeah, a lot of, a lot of embedded devices would be kind of, as Stephen said, monolithic. They execute the same binary the whole time. Um, and that would mean for some devices that they're constantly exposing a management port, even when they don't need to. Yeah. Right? But if you can dynamically load and unload code, I can dynamically load my management console when you need it and turn it off when you don't. So I close the attack surface and I reduce it. Um, and certainly on top of all of that, and we talked a little bit about regulations, but the European Cyber Resiliency Act is, is coming quick and we need to be able to update all those devices that we never thought we would. And Things like the component model, this very detailed software bill of materials, you know exactly what's in every piece of software that's deployed, and if I have a log4j style incident, I can just replace that component. That's cool. That's really powerful. So you know, there's a lot 
with, mod with what we're doing today, what's in production today, the isolation and the execution we've got solving this. And there's a lot more fun stuff, exciting stuff to come. <laughs> yeah, just on that, on that point, um, the ability to specify what a component or what a module is allowed to do, and basically by default nothing, you know, that, that's a very, very key, right? So that's very different also from running on a, on a server in Linux, right? As much as you have all these capabilities, but typically you can do everything by default. And uh, in our case, it should be exactly the opposite, right? And I think we can, we can make that work with, with Wasm, although maybe not everything is 100% is there yet, right? Right, and I think um, we're almost at the end of our time. Um, but um, as like probably a call to action or maybe a final point, can each of you all sort of like give the community assembled here um, any message? Uh, starting with you, Stephen, because you're sitting at the other end. <laughs> <laughs> sure, thank you. Um, I think from, from my perspective, um, you know, I would love to have people participate in what we're doing. So, you know, we have an open source product that is, uh, sorry, project that is the core of our runtime. It's called Project Ochre. It's a Linux Foundation Edge project. Um, I'd invite all of you to go check it out. And, you know, if you have questions, come see me. Love to have people participate. If you're building these systems, you want to understand how to, um, uh, you know, how to compartmentalize your application, what build tool chains we have available and all that. We'd love to hear your input and get your contribution. So. Uh, yeah, for us, um, we, I mentioned it earlier, we established the Embedded Special Interest Group. It's part of the Bytecode Alliance, and we're looking at what's coming in the core WebAssembly specification and what's coming with the WASI specifications and how we make them work on these embedded devices. Come along and join us. If you're building software for embedded devices, come and join. Uh, we'd value your expertise and views and opinions on things. The, one of the most exciting things in that SIG is how we've seen ideas bounce. You've seen some of it in the panel here. But I've seen ideas bounce, evolve, and just get so much better. And it, it's becoming a really exciting place. And it's a great opportunity for fellow travelers, people who wouldn't normally talk with each other, um, because we're maybe competitors in some spaces. But it's a really great opportunity for fellow travelers to come along and talk about the problems they see as they take uh, the WebAssembly micro runtime and the embedded approaches to, to WebAssembly forward and try and come up with those solutions. So come along, join us. Uh, my view is there is a huge opportunity on the edge. Uh, when you're looking at onshoring of manufacturing, you have to have automation. And you to get that automation using WebAssembly on these devices. But in the future, you can also start thinking of you know, Gen AI embedded at the edge that, that you can do some inferencing and make that the next level of automation and talking about safety and other things that you want to accomplish in this journey to the edge. I think yesterday, Dan, you talked about how much of vision is increasing on the edge. And, and you're going to need technologies like this to be working to make that happen. Um, you know, when I'm talking about vision, you know, inspection of items and everything else with cameras coming in. That's the next generation, not just on the website, but on the edge. You're going to get a new level of um, innovation and efficiencies built on. Um, well, I think it's mostly been said but, uh, by my colleagues here. But I think the one thing to, I would say, we should keep in mind maybe for the non-embedded uh, people is, uh, I guess we have this notion that any WASM program should run anywhere, you know, write once, run anywhere. It's a, it's a joke, I know, but, but we, we are actually much, much less concerned with that point in, in the embedded space, I would say. Like, yes, write the software against SDKs, compile it, and so on. But then between that and actually deploying and running it, anything goes, you know? So, for example, yesterday we saw a talk on the WASM to C. Great, if that works, and, and it, you know, fulfills all the properties, that's a perfectly reasonable way to go. It is not an interpreter. It is not an AOT, you know, compiler. It's just something else. It works. So we're really open to doing a lot more, uh, let's say, uh, you know, pre-deployment processing of the artifacts that come out of the, the build system. And that goes back to the point about the component model, which we love philosophically, but there are different ways to make it work. So one way to make it work would be to, again, build your components using the tool chain and then 
instead of relying on the canonical ABI, which we don't have, <laughs> right? We will process the components so that they do the serialization, deserialization inside each module, deploy it like that. And from the functional point of view, problem solved, we're good, you know? But that is not like within spec, so, so to speak, quote unquote, right? So I guess it's uh, something that we can, we can discuss, and we have discussed in the embedded SIG, but we can discuss more widely. <laughs> well, I was gonna say, this is why you should come to the embedded SIG. Yes. If you agree, disagree, or think we can do it better, come along. And I think with that, we're right on time. So thank you very much uh, for that wonderful discussion. I'm glad to have been part of that. And yeah, that's pretty much it. Uh, Bailey, over to you. If anybody has any questions, I don't know if we can take them. Yeah, we have time, we have time. Uh, any questions, audience? Hey, right here. Yeah, can you speak to the uh, certification process of you know, getting these WASM modules and components out onto these devices and you know, through the bureaucracy and regulation space? We need to repeat that question real quick. So, um, uh, will you repeat that? Today? Can I can I speak to the certification process for getting uh, certified, approved WASM modules and components out? Uh, yes, we haven't done it. Right, <laughs> um, not there yet. Um, I'm even today speaking to colleagues in the, in the room. You know, I'm learning about new efforts that are happening that are really exciting. So, uh, I, I'd say. Keep watching, it's coming, right? That's, that's a promise. Um, I think the gentleman over there has raised it. I don't know if I, anybody else did. Yeah. Hi. Um, uh, so when I think of an industrial PLC or IPC, I believe there's two chips inside that both have to make the same determination before a machine or robot uh, uh, does something, if, before it actuates. So, uh, I think you t uh, the question was uh, if, so in, in these, um, some of these safety critical systems, they require like lockstep computation on two different pieces of hardware and they need to agree in order to take the action. Um, and the question is, do we need to change the WASM spec to, to make that work? I have no idea. I, don't, I, I wouldn't think so, but what, what do you guys think? Uh, I don't think so, but you get, you get into this very philosophical world of what do we mean by safety? Um, and there is this push in the industry in general to start thinking about well, safety criticality and certification, which it can be industry dependent, right? So the aerospace industry does it one way, the automobile industry does it one way, the rail industry does it another way. Um, and, but a lot of it all boils down to that determinism. Everything does the same thing in the same way. Um, and verifying that and making sure if there's an error that you can catch it. But the, then the, the question becomes, well, is that really safety? Is that just determinism? And what do we mean by safety? Um, and that gets particularly interesting when you move into the world of statistical programming. So it's no longer hard rule-based. You're now moving into the world of uh, maybe it's an AI model that's giving you an instruction. Where does that sit? How do I qualify that as safe or not safe? So. The underlying infrastructure that builds our safety critical systems today is starting to slowly migrate and change. You can see it coming down the line, particularly in the world of academia. So things are modifying, but there's not, no changes yet, nothing happening yet in the regulatory bodies to shift away from it. Um, perhaps one of the most compelling regular body, regulatory body change in certification was the um, the FDA, and it was approving um, our colleagues in Siemens Health and Ears have a product called AI Rad that helps a radiographer spot issues. Um, that's available to purchase today, and that AI model, they worked with the FDA to, do, to find the safety critical features for certifying that. And because that was a brand new approach to it, statistical programming, how do you validate that this works? Um, they had to work very closely with the FDA on that, make some changes. I'm getting off topic here. It's nothing to do with WebAssembly, but you can see it coming. You can see this change in safety critical definition coming down the line. But it, it's, a, it's a really interesting conversation, um, and I think part of it does go towards academia. In terms of WebAssembly, I don't think WebAssembly is going to redefine what safety is. We're going to provide a mechanism for executing code in a safe and deterministic way, which are core parts of what the WebAssembly spec is trying to achieve today. So there's no change. I'll 
add a, add a couple of things to both your, your comments too. I, I think one of the tools that we have with WebAssembly is we have the ability to, to have these binaries and it's portable code that we can then run in different places. Yes, we may AOT compile it, but that code, um, the source of that is code, it's not source. We're not recompiling that. So when I recompile it with a different tool chain with different compiler options, I'm gonna get different characteristics. So if I'm building these safety uh, systems, I'm going to have to go through a lot of integration and then a lot of testing and then recertification. When I can share those at the binary level, that solves some of the problems. It doesn't solve all of the problems, but it solves uh, some of the problems because I can take that code that's known to be run correct, known to be safety certified, and put it in a different system. Yes, I still have to do certification. Yes, I still have to do testing, but I've reduced some of that friction, and I think that's a, a, a huge, uh, huge thing. And then I can also provide things like signatures and S-bombs so I know that I'm running exactly what I expected, what exactly was tested, what was certified, and potentially even enforce that cryptographically, right? 